This is a heat exchanger that most everyone is familiar with. An air conditioner in your home or office or in your car removes heat from the inside air and transfers it outside. This heat exchanger does a similar job. A car's radiator takes heat away from the engine and transfers it to the outside air. A space heater in your plant is another familiar heat exchanger. It takes heat from a fuel and transfers it to the air in the plant to keep you warm in the winter. All these heat exchangers, and the many others we'll be seeing, share a common task. What they do is take heat from one place and transfer it somewhere else by exchanging it from one medium to another. A heat exchanger can be used to cool something, like freezing water into ice, or it can be used to heat things, like cooking your food. In order to understand how heat exchangers can do all these different jobs, you need to know a little about how heat is transferred. To begin with, heat always flows from a hotter object to a colder one. This is because there is more thermal energy in a hot object and less in a cold one. What this means is that if you are trying to cool something, you have to take the thermal energy away from it and dispose of it somewhere. If you're trying to heat something up, you've got to get the necessary heat from some source of thermal energy. But no matter how heat is transferred, it always goes downhill from hot to cold, from a higher temperature to a lower temperature. There are three ways heat can move from one place to another. Heat can be transferred by radiation, it can be transferred by conduction, or it can be transferred by convection. Let's take a closer look at each of the three different kinds of heat transfer. First off, we mentioned radiation. The sun, burning at millions of degrees, throws out heat in all directions, radiating it across the emptiness of space. Radiation is the way heat is transferred through a vacuum, although radiant heat will also go through some things like clear plastic or glass. Radiant heat is the way your bread is heated in your toaster oven. The second way of transferring heat we mentioned was conduction. Conduction is how heat is transferred through a solid object. When one portion of a solid object is heated, that area contains more thermal energy than other colder parts of the material. To even out the distribution of heat within the object, some of the heat energy is transferred to the relatively colder areas. If the object continues to be heated, a constant flow of heat takes place from the hotter to the cooler parts of the material. Convection is the third type of heat transfer. Convection refers to the movement of heat through a fluid, such as air or water. When a fluid travels over a hot object, it picks up heat and carries the heat energy with it. The heat can then be transferred to another cooler object as the fluid passes over it. These three kinds of heat flow, radiation, conduction, and convection, describe the ways that heat is transferred between objects. Radiation is how heat is transferred across empty space. Conduction is how heat is transferred through solid objects. And convection is the transfer of heat due to the motion of liquids and gases. Heat exchangers use all three to a greater or lesser degree to perform their functions. Let's use the cooling system of a car as an example to see how. Most cars are water-cooled. They use water or a mix of water and a chemical coolant to take excess heat away from the engine. First off, heat is carried from the combustion chamber into the engine by the radiant energy of the hot gases in the cylinder. Then conduction takes over, and heat is carried through the metal of the engine block and head. Convection takes place in the flow of water or coolant through the engine as the coolant picks up the heat energy from its contact with the engine's inside surfaces. This energy is transferred as the cooler fluid in the flow mixes with the warmer fluid coming away from the surfaces of the engine. When the flow of coolant reaches the car's radiator, it gives up its heat by convection again as it flows over the tubes in the coils. Conduction carries the heat through the walls of the tubes. As air passes over the coils, heat is carried away by convection as well as by some direct radiation. From this, we can see that all three types of heat transfer, radiation, conduction, and convection, 
are important to the efficient operation of heat exchangers. Here are some of the factors that affect heat transfer in heat exchangers. The type of material it's made of and its thickness. Also, the kind of fluid in the heat exchanger, its total volume and its rate of flow. The temperature difference from one fluid to another and any contaminant that's present in the fluid or on the walls of the heat exchanger's tubes. We'll talk about the first factor first, the type of material the heat exchanger is made of. Several different metals can be used for the tubes in heat exchangers, depending on the temperature and pressure at which they have to operate. They have to be strong enough to allow for fairly thin walls to provide the greatest amount of heat transfer. The metal also has to be resistant to corrosion and erosion. The thinner the wall can be and still be strong enough to hold the necessary pressure, the faster heat is transferred from one medium to another. If the tubes become corroded, they can thicken with the corrosion and lose efficiency. The tube material can also be eaten away by corrosion or worn thin by erosion from the fluid so the tube loses strength and can fail. These are all important things to consider in the care and maintenance of heat exchangers. And heat exchangers are really important parts of our lives. Think about what might happen if the cooling system of your car failed in some way. You'd have to fix whatever went wrong before you could even drive the car home. Even heat exchangers, which are more luxuries than necessities, like air conditioners, are pretty important parts of our daily lives. If they aren't working right, we do something about it. Now, so far, we've seen what a heat exchanger is by looking at some common examples. We've looked at the general principles of how they work by seeing the three ways heat is transferred, radiation, conduction, and convection. And we talked about how important heat exchangers are to us in our daily lives. In the next segment, we'll look at some heat exchangers that you might find at the plant where you work. We'll see how they are similar to our everyday examples and how they are different. Before going on, though, pause to study segment one of your text. When you've done the exercises, you'll have a more thorough understanding of what we've talked about so far. In the plant, heat exchangers are just as important to us as the common ones we find in our day-to-day -day private lives. Just as the radiator in our car serves a necessary cooling function and also provides for more efficiency in the overall operating systems of the car, the heat exchangers used in the plant serve necessary functions and also improve plant efficiency and safety. Heat exchangers are designed to do a number of jobs. They condense steam used in power and heating systems. They cool machinery and components operating at high temperatures. And they heat incoming cold water or fuel in heating or generating systems. Heat exchangers help to increase the plant's efficiency by converting what would be wasted energy to a useful purpose or by conserving energy within a closed system. Heat exchangers are also used to improve plant safety by controlling temperatures and generating manufacturing or finishing processes. They also protect machinery by removing excess heat. Our car's cooling system is an excellent example of using heat exchangers for this purpose. We also find that pretty often a plant's heating system is tied into the steam or hot water process system to provide economical heat for the plant and offices during the winter. From all this we can see that heat exchangers are important to us on the job as well as to the operation of the plant. They make important operations of the plant function they increase the overall efficiency of the plant's processes, and they improve our safety and protect expensive equipment and machinery. Let's take a look at some of the heat exchangers in the plant and see how they do all these different jobs. Now, as we go through and look at the heat exchangers in a typical plant, we'll deal with them in three categories. These are condensers, where vapor is converted back into liquid, shell and tube heat exchangers, which can be used either as heaters or coolers, and direct contact heaters, which can be either closed or open to the atmosphere. The first two types, condensers and shell and tube heat exchangers, 
are called surface heat exchangers because the fluid passing over a surface gives up its heat through the surface to the fluid on the other side. In these heat exchangers, we don't want the two fluids to come in direct contact with each other. This might be because you've got two different fluids going through, like water and lubricating oil, or it can be because you're afraid one may contaminate the other. For example, river water used in a condenser might contaminate the more pure steam on the other side. In the other type, the direct contact heat exchanger, steam is used to heat water. The steam condenses, mixes with the water, and goes back into the system. Let's take a closer look at each one of the three we're considering. Condensers and shell and tube heat exchangers, which are surface types, and direct contact heat exchangers. A condenser is made up of a shell, which is the main part of its structure. This holds the sheets to which the tubes are attached. The tube sheets at each end support the tubes and isolate the water boxes from the rest of the shell. Ordinarily, a large steam-driven turbine used to drive a generator or a pump has a condenser right beneath it. The turbine exhausts steam into the condenser where it gives up heat. This is not always the case, though. Smaller steam turbines may have a separate condenser nearby or might exhaust into the main condenser of a large turbine. Condensers, as we noted, are used to convert vapor back into liquid. They do this by passing the vapor over a bundle of tubes that have cold water running through them. As the hot vapor comes in contact with the cold tubes, it gives up heat and condenses back into liquid. The water gets hotter as it goes through because it picks up heat from the vapor through the walls of the tube by conduction. The water carries the heat away by convection as it flows. Shell and tube heat exchangers are similar to condensers in many ways. The shell is the main body of the heat exchanger and holds the tubes and tube supports. The tube sheets isolate the water box and support the tube bundle at its ends. When we refer to the shell side, we mean the area within the shell and around the outside of the tubes. When we talk about the tube side, we're referring to what goes through the inside of the tubes. Shell and tube heat exchangers come in many different styles, depending on the purpose for which they're designed. They may have either a vertical or a horizontal shell, depending on floor space and headroom, as well as efficiency demands. Shell and tube exchangers may be single pass, meaning that the fluid on the tube side goes through just once, or multi-pass, which means the fluid goes through the tubes more than once. The tube arrangement may be straight tube or U-tube. A straight tube exchanger might be a multi-pass unit if the head at one end is divided into two water boxes, one for inlet and one for outlet. The flow through a shell and tube exchanger with a straight tube single pass arrangement can be parallel flow, reverse flow, called counter flow, or cross flow. Parallel flow means the fluid to be heated or cooled is flowing in the same direction as the cooling or heating fluid. In the counterflow type, they pass in opposite directions. The counterflow arrangement is more efficient because the temperature out of the cold fluid can actually be higher than the exiting temperature of the hot fluid. This is because a higher temperature difference is maintained all the way through. Crossflow is where the shell side fluid passes crossways over the tube bundle. Most condensers are crossflow. Although condensers and shell and tube heat exchangers are similar in many ways, they usually don't look alike. Direct contact heat exchangers, on the other hand, may look quite like a shell and tube exchanger, but don't share many other similarities. The direct contact exchanger is a heater used to heat feed water for a boiler. It condenses the inlet steam back to water, which goes back into the feed water system. This type of heat exchanger is sometimes called a deaerating heater or a cascading heater because the incoming feed water cascades down through the condensing steam and it all falls down to an outlet or a storage tank. 
This gets rid of air and gases that are trapped in the feed water. We'll see later how these are the only kinds of heaters that can do this. Just like a shell and tube heat exchanger, the direct contact heater may have a vertical shell or a horizontal shell. And the storage tank may also be vertical or horizontal, depending on design requirements. On the inside, a direct contact heat exchanger can be one of three basic designs, spray, tray, or a combination. A spray deaerator sprays the incoming feed water down through a steam-filled space where air and gases, which can't be condensed, are scrubbed away by the live steam. The air and other gases are vented either to open air or to a condenser. In tray deaerators, the feed water cascades over a set of trays while steam heats it up and strips it of the non-condensable gases. The third type combines both the spray and the tray designs for even greater efficiency and capacity. So far in this part of the program, we've identified the broad categories of heat exchangers we'll be dealing with. Of course, there are many others, some of which you're already familiar with, like your air conditioner at home or your car's cooling system we mentioned earlier. Even a heating furnace or boiler are considered to be heat exchangers. However, we are primarily concerned with the three we've examined here, condensers, shell and tube heat exchangers, and direct contact heat exchangers. Our concern is with how they operate and what we have to do to make them operate the best they can. In this part, we've seen graphic representation of the ways each of the three categories work, how they are similar, and the differences between them. Next, we're going to look at examples in the plant, one type at a time, and see how the real life world relates to what you've just seen. First, though, pause to study your workbook and do the exercises to make sure you understand what we've said here. Your instructor can answer any questions you may still have and give you further information about the types of heat exchangers in your plant. As we have seen graphically, a condenser is a heat exchanger which converts a vapor back to a liquid. The condenser on a turbine takes steam directly from the turbine's exhaust and runs it over a bundle of tubes. The tubes have cold water being pumped through them from a source like a cooling pond, a river, a lake, or an ocean. As the steam passes over the tube bundle, it gives up its heat to the cooling water. When the steam gets down to the point where it turns to water again, it forms droplets on the tubes and falls into the hot well from which it's pumped back into the feed water system. Let's see what this looks like in real life. This is a main steam condenser for a turbine like the one in our sketch. Steam comes down from the turbine on the deck above. River water is pumped through a set of filtering screens into the inlet water box. The water flows from the inlet water box through a tube bundle to the other side of the condenser. The water box on the other side is open on the inside from top to bottom, so water can flow up to the tube bundle above and come back through to the outlet water box and on out to drain. Now, the steam's been passing from top to bottom, and as it flows down, it gets cooler and cooler and finally condenses into water on the tubes. It falls down through here and is returned to the boiler feed water system. Let's see what it looks like in here. They've been working on this unit. It's been drained and tagged out. Well, even under the best conditions, it's not always this clean. The crew's been here before us, and they did a good job, too. The tube sheet's cleared of debris, and the water box is clean. The seal area will be clean, so we can be sure the seal will stay tight and the tubes have been cleared. They either shot them through with some high pressure water or maybe cleaning brushes, squeegees, or scrapers. This guy's ready to go back into service. But all's been done here then has been routine maintenance during planned downtime. They shut down the system, drained the condenser, and tagged out all the valves and pumps so no one would get nailed by someone accidentally letting the river in. 
After safety checks for breathable air and making sure there was adequate ventilation, the crew cleaned out all the tubes and got all the crud out of the water boxes. They checked for leaking tubes and plugged any they found. When the job was done, they sealed it up and ran a pressure differential check to make sure everything was uptight. And we're back in business. Later on, we'll see some of these procedures in detail. Routine maintenance jobs like these are the kinds of things we do most often. But there are other things that need to be done when something goes wrong. For instance, suppose you find out in the middle of a peak load that your condensers leaking junk from the river into the condensate and fouling up the feed water system. Well, leaks usually start small, and with routine checks, we can catch them before they make too much of a mess. When a leak or a series of small leaks shows up and you just can't shut down the whole system to plug them, there's still something you can do. There are a number of substances you can dump into the cooling water before it gets into the condenser. Since for greatest efficiency, the shell side is run under a vacuum, the substance will get drawn to any leaks in the tubes or tube sheets. Sawdust is one of several biodegradable substances which can be used to plug leaking condenser tubes when the unit has to remain in service. Through a fair amount of experimentation, it's been found that redwood sawdust is the best because it doesn't sink to the bottom of the water boxes or float to the top without going through the tubes. And when the stuff goes through a leaking tube, it gets drawn into the leak. As they absorb water, sawdust and certain other substances that are used expand to several times their original volume, a lot like this compressed sponge. So they fill the leak and get bigger to stuff it so tightly no more leakage can take place. Sawdust is an example of a good stopgap measure you can use to save the day when you're in a pinch. Of course, there are a lot of ingenious solutions to problems like these, and approaches differ from place to place, but the idea is the same anywhere. Whatever is done to the system to shortcut problems or keep it up when something goes wrong, you have to think of what's going to happen somewhere else as a result of what you can do to fix the problem. Further on, we'll get into some of the specifics of the tasks we've been talking about in this part of the program. Before we do, we'll cover some general points in the other broad categories of heat exchangers we'll be dealing with. Pause here, though, and spend some time going through the materials in the text. After you answer the questions and get answers to any questions you may have about your own plant's condensers, your instructor will help you to familiarize yourself with the condensers in your facility, what they do, and show what goes on at your place to keep them working top notch. When we come back, we'll take a similar close look at the shell and tube type of exchangers like the ones in your plant. In an earlier part of this program where we talked about the three basic categories of heat exchangers we want to consider, we look briefly at how a shell and tube exchanger works. Let's look a little more closely at a representation of a typical shell and tube heat exchanger and learn more about them. Just like condensers, in shell and tube exchangers, the two fluids passing through do not come in contact with each other. One of them will be going through the shell of the unit, while the other will be flowing through the tubes. As we've seen, shell and tube heat exchangers come in several different arrangements. They may be either vertical or horizontal, depending on space considerations. The way the tubes are arranged also differs. You may have straight tubes or U-tubes in a given unit. Flow through a shell and tube exchanger can be single or multi-pass for either or both of the fluids in the system. The two fluids can flow in the same direction, called parallel flow, or opposite direction, called counter flow, or across one another, called cross flow. Now let's look at some typical shell and tube heat exchangers and graphically peer inside each of them and see how they work. The examples we'll be seeing have a number of different things flowing through them. They may be water and oil, like this little lube oil cooler, 
They may be steam and fuel oil, like this heater. They may be steam and water, like this air ejector condenser, or like this feed water heater where steam is used to preheat the water going into a boiler. We'll start with a simple single pass straight tube heat exchanger. Our first example is an oil cooler. Actually, we're going to see two examples but they both do pretty much the same job the same way. This is an oil cooler used to cool the oil circulating through the bearings of a motor driving a pump. Oil from the motor flows through the shell side while cool water flows through the tube side. This one is a two-pass design to allow the cooling water to pick up as much heat as possible. The hot oil from the motor comes in here, goes through the shell this way, and comes out here to go back to the motor. Cold water comes in this inlet and flows twice through the tubes in opposite directions to take away more heat than would be possible in a single pass. This cooler does a similar job cooling the oil in a hydraulic coupling system on this motor-driven fan assembly. Oil from the coupling system comes in here and is cooled by the flow of cold water before exiting here to provide the hydraulic link between the motor and the fan. This is a very simplified cross-section of a straight tube two-pass heat exchanger like these two coolers. The two chambers at the ends are the headers. In a condenser they're called water boxes. The cooling water flows in one side of the water box goes through twice and out the other side of the water box. The oil flows through the shell side in a single pass. In both these heaters, oil enters at this end and comes out of the shell at the other end. Baffles in the shell cause the oil to flow over all the tubes several times. Like the flow arrangement, you'll notice that the appearance of the two coolers is similar. Now this big guy is an oil heater. What it does is heat the fuel oil for a big oil-fired boiler to a temperature high enough to make it easy to pump and easy to ignite in the boiler. Instead of using water to cool the oil on the shell side, the heater has steam going through the tubes to heat the fuel oil going in the shell. Heating the oil makes it easier to pump, makes it flow through the spray nozzles to atomize more easily, and the hotter it is, the more readily it'll burn in the furnace of the boiler. Steam comes in here, passes through a U-tube bundle, and exits here as water. Fuel oil is pumped in at the other end and comes out here on its way to the burner nozzles in the boiler. If we want a simplified picture of this heater, we can use this one. Instead of water going through straight tubes in two passes, we've got steam flowing through U-tubes and being condensed as it heats the oil. Instead of lube oil, we're pumping fuel oil through the shell side. Just like the fuel oil is preheated before it's sent to the boiler, feed water going into the boiler is preheated to make it easier to turn into steam. This feed water heater is used to do this job. It's like the fuel oil preheater because it uses steam to heat the incoming feed water. What's different about this heater, though, is that the steam goes through the shell and condenses on the outside of the tubes. The feed water comes into the lower half of the header here and passes through the U-tube bundles to be pumped out here to go on to the boiler. The internal arrangement is very similar to the fuel oil heater. The two are quite similar in size. These examples are just four of a large number of shell and tube heat exchangers you may run into in your duties in the plant. As we've seen, they come in a number of different types, depending on the job they have to do and certain limitations of design and use. Later on, we'll see some of the steps taken to diagnose and cure problems that crop up in the operation of units such as the ones we've seen here. Next, though, we're going to look at direct contact heat exchangers. We'll see how this type differs from the units we've studied so far. And we'll see some similarities this third category shares with the first two. Before going on to the next part, 
Look through Section 4 of your workbook for further information on shell and tube heat exchangers. Work the exercises and check your answers to make sure you understand what we've gone over so far. This section of the program deals with a type of heat exchanger that's very different from the shell and tube exchangers and condensers we've seen earlier. We're going to talk about the direct contact heater. Although they operate differently, direct contact heaters do share certain similarities with the first two types. Let's look into the way these direct contact heat exchangers work, and as we go along, why don't you compare your ideas about similarities and differences with the conclusions we'll come to. Direct contact heaters come in three basic types. The spray type, the tray type, and a combination of the first two. The first kind is the type which has spray nozzles which spray incoming feed water down from the top through a rush of steam. This steam heats the falling water spray, condenses into water, and falls to join the feed water as it goes on its way to the boiler. The principle of the second kind is the same, but this one has water coming in and cascading over trays like a waterfall. As the water runs down over the trays, it's mixed with the live steam in the shell and gets heated up just as in our first example. At the same time, the steam is condensed into water and falls down to join the feed water system. Our third example is a little more efficient unit because it combines both the spray and tray methods. Spray nozzles direct the incoming feed water down through the live steam coming up from the inlet. As it falls onto these carefully positioned trays, it condenses some of the steam and is heated up. The condensed water from the steam joins the feed water as it flows down over the trays and the water picks up even more heat as it falls past the hotter incoming steam. Direct contact heaters then drain the heated feed water and condensed steam either into a storage tank or it can be directly pumped into the boiler feed system. The reason for using these direct contact heaters in line with shell and tube type heat exchangers is that they do something a shell and tube heater cannot do. These heaters help remove oxygen as well as other non-condensable gases from the water because these gases may be corrosive to the system. Gases are removed by heating the water to near saturation temperature, the temperature at which it turns to steam, and then scrubbing it with fresh steam. Passing the hot water at near boiling temperatures through the live steam in the shell makes it give up its trapped gases. The gases that are released are vented either to atmosphere or to a vent condenser. These deaerating direct contact heaters come in several different styles, depending on the capacity needed and on space considerations. For industrial operations that don't require a lot of storage capacity, a single shell in either vertical or horizontal arrangement may be enough. Larger industrial and utility plants may use vertical shells on horizontal storage tanks, and those needing the most flow capacity will use a horizontal shell on a horizontal tank. The example we're looking at here is in a fair-sized power plant. Because of space limitations and the capacity needed, it's a vertical shell mounted on a horizontal storage tank. As we've been looking at the workings of direct contact heat exchangers, you've had a chance to see how very different they are, both in operation and internal arrangement from condensers and shell and tube heat exchangers. Earlier, though, we mentioned there are certain ways that these are very similar to the other two types. What we'd like you to do now is pause to work through section five of your text and answer the questions. If you have further questions of your own, your instructor can answer them for you. Afterwards, spend some classroom time talking about the ways the different kinds of heat exchangers are similar to each other. When we come back, we'll take a close look at the similarities between these different types of heat exchangers and how these similarities affect your job maintaining heat exchangers where you work. We'll also take a look at some of the effects of heat exchanger maintenance problems and how these effects can serve as clues to the source of some of the problems.
I'd expect that if you'd given it much thought, you probably had a lively discussion about how such different heat exchangers can have some strong similarities. Actually, the similarities can even outnumber the differences. All the heat exchangers we're concerned with take a couple of fluids, either liquid or gas, that are operating at different temperatures and pass heat from one to the other to make their temperatures more equal. Now, there are other similarities between the various types of heat exchangers, and this segment is about some of these similarities. In fact, if you spend much time in discussion, I'd bet you'd probably already mentioned some of them. Basically, there are only two maintenance problems associated with something as simple as a heat exchanger, and all heat exchangers are subject to both of them. Of course, the causes for these two problems can be just as widely different as the heat exchangers themselves. But there are still only two basic problems that will cause grief in a heat exchanger. Either the thing will get stopped up or crudded up so much its efficiency goes to pot, or it'll spring a leak and endanger the system in another way. Let's look at the causes for the individual problems one by one. Now, lots of things can accumulate in a heat exchanger system depending on what's going through the system, whether the system's open or closed, and what impurities might enter with the fluids. Let's take a main condenser for our first example. Many times the cooling water for a large condenser, such as this one, comes from a river or large lake or perhaps even the ocean. In a system like this, only so much filtration will work because filters and screens get clogged up and have to be cleaned too. A certain amount of silt, algae, water plants, fish, and eels will get pumped into the condenser's inlet water box. Anything that isn't small and flexible enough to go through will get snared at the opening of the tubes in the tube sheet and will be held there by the rush of water going in. Silt and algae will form gooey accumulation on the face of the tube sheet and will also build up inside the tubes, too. When this happens, not only does the amount of cooling water get reduced, but the buildup on the walls of the tubes cuts down drastically on the efficiency of the heat transfer. What this means is that there's less cooling water flowing through, and what is flowing through isn't as effective as it should be. So what happens is the temperatures rise, affecting the entire system. Any time deposits build up on tube walls, whether it's slime, chemical deposits, or what have you, the added thickness of the deposit cuts down on the ideal heat transfer of the tube. Corrosion deposits can even cause the tubes to be eaten away. In some units, usually those that have to use unpurified water, there is a simple little thing that's done to prevent corrosion from attacking critical parts of the condenser or heat exchanger. This gizmo is what's called a sacrificial anode. It's made of a metal, usually zinc or one of its alloys, that reacts to the chemistry of the water and neutralizes it to a point that it doesn't attack other parts that might cause serious problems. These anodes are easy to inspect and very easy to replace to keep things running well. Corrosion and deposits can cause problems in direct contact heat exchangers too. The thing chemical deposits or corrosion can crud up fastest is the inlet at the top. Now when this happens, the condensate flow can get cut down drastically. Then the unit must be run under higher pressures to keep feed water flowing to the boiler fast enough. This makes regular inspection and cleaning a real necessity. Now as we mentioned earlier, there are two maintenance problems common to heat exchangers. Crud and corrosion are not all that can go wrong. Leaks caused by erosion of the tube wall surfaces, cracks caused by corrosion and by vibration can cause critical problems. When a leak occurs, it doesn't take awfully long to foul up a system. Water and lubricating oil can destroy machinery by causing bearing failures. Impurities in feed water systems can cause rapid erosion of boiler tubes and other high temperature, high pressure system parts. Oil in feed water can cause foaming in boiler tubes, which can lead to overheating and consequent boiler failure. So you can see that the things that can go wrong with heat exchangers are just as simple as the units themselves. But whatever does go wrong can cause a lot of problems in the whole system. 
Now stop here for a while and go through the material in your text. Answer the questions at the end and ask your instructor to clear up any questions you may have. We'll be back in the next segment to answer one question which is directly related. How do you find out what's going wrong before it makes a mess of everything? In the last segment, we saw what usually goes wrong with heat exchangers, and we talked a little about how big an impact heat exchanger problems can have on the system as a whole. Somehow then, we've got to be able to catch these problems before they get big enough to cause us some real grief. Preventive maintenance is one way we can keep everything running on an even keel. Whenever the system's down for some reason, we can schedule opening up and inspecting at least the major components of the system the units that could cause the most trouble if they had a failure or blockage. Inspection and cleaning routinely when the system is shut down is just good practice. We can find things which may be getting ready to give us trouble and fix the problem before it becomes serious. But when the system is running and something starts to go wrong, how do we catch it before it gets really big? Well, troubleshooting the overall system is a responsibility that's shared three ways. The control operators have a share in this. The people in the chem lab who monitor all the plant's chemistry, not just environmental stuff, and you. Maintenance doesn't do it all, but it does do a very important part. In fact, there are some checks you can make while you perform your daily routine that can be the very first indication of something gone wrong before anyone else has had a chance to notice. Eyeballing bearing temperature on components that require cooling is one of these. If anything is out of line, call it to your supervisor's attention. He'll know the correct action to take. Reporting anything like that that's out of line, even if you just happen to casually notice it, may save a lot of trouble. After all, if something fails, you're the person who may have to fix it. Another example of early warning inspection is site glass reading. Any impurities in oil or water, whatever's being monitored, will be obvious, and you should call attention to it immediately. The problem may be small, but this is the time to fix the problem, not what it may cause later. These are examples of what you can do as a maintenance person to help identify potential problems and solve them before they become something gross. Of course, in your job, you may find a work order coming down for a problem that may not have been apparent to you. Let's take a look at some of the other ways we might troubleshoot problems related to heat exchangers in the system. In the control room, for example, the operators have gauges which give a constant readout of plant functions. They've got telltales to call their attention to anything they might have overlooked. And they have alarms which tell them if a part of the system is starting to seriously malfunction. The operators are always monitoring plant efficiency by taking figures from a number of gauges and recorders and comparing the figures they get with a practical ideal figure. If efficiency in the system as a whole or a part of the system falls rapidly or falls steadily, it's a clue to them to look more closely to pinpoint where the problem may lie. For example, if the temperature of the condensate from the main condenser is too high and at the same time the cooling water temperature coming out of the condenser is low, it means that deposits are probably affecting efficient heat transfer in the condenser, which could lead to inefficient turbine operation due to low vacuum. Or Maybe the pressure and flow rate of the cooling water has to be abnormally high just to keep condensate temperatures and flow within normal bounds. Then you've probably got blockage in the condenser from junk that got past the screens. When it goes so far, it's time to bring down the load and open up one side at a time to clean it out. Another place notice of a potential problem may come from is the chem lab. The people in the lab are always checking samples of feed water and circulating water for signs of contamination. If anything's found, they can tell just what's fouling things up and where it's coming from. In this way, their routine checks can tell you you've got a problem before it gets large enough to show in any other way. So all of you are important in troubleshooting problems in the system. Leaks and blockage, deposits which can kill plant efficiency, all these can be found early enough to save a lot of work if everybody's on the ball. Don't count on the other guy to catch things for you. He may not be as sharp as you are, or he may forget to call it to someone's attention. With a little experience,
keeping your eyes peeled for signs of potential problems may save you some big maintenance problems in the future. In this unit on heat exchangers, we've had a chance to examine just what heat exchangers are and how they work. They transfer heat from one medium to another. We've looked at some typical heat exchangers. We've seen the simple problems you may have to deal with, and we've seen how you can catch them before they become serious. In the next unit on heat exchangers, we'll be seeing how to find exactly where a problem lies and what kind of maintenance you may have to do to heat exchangers. Before going on, though, Work your way through the last section of your text and answer the questions at the end. Your instructor will have some final review questions to make sure you've caught everything that's been thrown at you in this unit. 